So hello again and welcome back to my channel and um, don't forget to like and subscribe if you uh, enjoy these videos. It'd be great to get some more subscribers and uh, I'll hopefully have some more guitars to show you soon. So today, as mentioned in the title, it's the Firebird. So a quick bit of history about the Firebird. Back in the early 60s, Ted McCarty of Gibson recruited a car designer called Ray Dietrich and uh, he was brought in to try and revive uh, the Gibson guitar range. Uh, they'd had the Les Paul that uh, wasn't doing so well and they'd also released an Explorer which although nowadays we think is a fantastic guitar, back then it wasn't selling so well. So Ray Dietrich had a look at the Explorer and uh, he rounded it off and gave it more car type features and you can see the elements of uh, the Explorer in the Firebird. And they were released in, I think, 1963 and went on for a couple of years. And there was various iterations. Uh, there was a Firebird 1 with one pickup. There was a Firebird 3, uh, the Firebird 5, which this is based on, and a Firebird 7. And they all had vibrolas and various pickup combinations. Now, as I said, the, the Firebird um, was a new design and it was new in that there was a three-body construction of the neck. So you can see that the neck goes right through the body here and these wings are added on the side during construction. And it makes it a large guitar and it also makes it an expensive guitar to build. And that was the problem. <clears throat> they weren't that popular, they didn't sell that well in the 60s and it were expensive to make and then they had Fender come along and say hey that looks a bit too much like a Jaguar or a uh, one of the other Fender guitars so guitar uh, so gives them reacted by actually deciding well we're going to turn it upside down and build what they call the non-reverse Firebird which is when the body shape is more normal shaped and they went on with that for a while and uh, that was it for the Firebird in the, what we call the reverse version. Then in 1972, uh, to celebrate the Olympics, uh, they came up with called the Medallion Firebird. Uh, I think they made 366 of them because it was a leap year and it was one for every day. And they had little emblems, medallions actually, in the bodywork. And uh, that was the first reissue. So after the reissue in 1972 of the Medallion range, uh, Gibson decided to do another reissue in 1976 to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the founding of the US. And so we have the Bicentennial Firebird, of which this is one. So this is essentially a Firebird 5. Um, the difference is that uh, instead of a vibrola you have a stop tailpiece. And as a small touch, the um, Phoenix here is in red, white and blue rather than red. I think it's normal. It also has limited edition uh, stamped on the back. I'll show some close-ups as I'm talking as well. So they made I think around 2,800 of these. Uh, there were around I think 1,280 black ones, a similar sort of number of natural ones and then there were some sunburst ones and some Olympic white ones which were made in much smaller numbers around sort of 100 to 200. So they're much rarer. Now, they were made between 76 and 78. Um, only a small number were actually made in 76. So only 222 of the black and gold were genuine bicentennial firebirds made in 1976. And this is one of them. So this has a low serial number to indicate it's 1976. And as such, it's quite a rare beast. As I said, it's one of uh, 222 that were ever made. And so it's probably the most collectible of that range. I mean, obviously it doesn't get close to these 60s Firebirds, which, especially if they're in a custom colour, can reach you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the, the issue with Firebirds, um, especially in the 60s, uh, where the cases weren't so good, is that I would say most of them, or a good number of them, have net breaks of some sort. And just to bring the sort of spirit to being totally open, this one does have a crack. And uh, it was one of my early mistakes as a collector that I didn't bring a UV light with me. And the, the shop that was selling it uh, didn't mention any cracks, and I should have asked. So, you know, I'm not blaming anyone. 
Having said that, um, because certainly firebirds have cracks, it's really hard to not you know, to find one that's in absolutely perfect condition and people don't seem to mention when there's a crack or not. And they are very common. And as I said, there were only 222 made of these genuine 76 ones. So I don't regret it really. It's fair. It may have, it's probably impacted the value slightly, but um, yeah, still a great guitar. So there we have it, uh, the uh, Bicentennial Firebird. Um, really happy to have it. It's not the easiest guitar to play. It has quite a chunky neck. Um, it has the typical sort of quite low frets that you get on Gibsons of that era. Uh, the banjo tuners make it quite neck heavy. And of course they are the Achilles heel if you, if you I'm not sure if you can see, but they protrude below the line of the body. <clears throat> so what typically happens, uh, the guitar will fall over, hit those banjo tuners and you've got a broken neck. Um, there's just lots of them like that, there's not much to be done about it. So anyway, there you have it. Um, one final thing, uh, uh, the, the, the intro music that uh, at the beginning was of course Amazona by uh, Roxy Music. And uh, that brings me around to kind of why I started playing guitar again. Um, well, not again, but in the first place. And I think most people have sort of guitar heroes and I think most people's guitar heroes tend to be people like Jimi Hendrix or Stevie Ray or you know Jimmy Page. But I was really enamoured with Phil Manzanera and people like that, sort of art school guitarists. And I first saw them on a, a programme in the UK called The Old Grey Whistle Test. And I just remember seeing Brian Ferry looking very, very cool and this crazy looking guitarist with his bug eye sunglasses playing a red Firebird and it must have been a, a custom 60s Firebird and so worth quite a lot now. Um, but he just looked so different and it wasn't the typical guitar hero posing, it was just thought would that be so cool to be part of a band like that. Um, and then of course you, you see other guitarists of the time like Mick Ronson, you know, David Bowie's sideman and you start thinking yeah, guitar is a cool thing to play, I need to get one. Um, and actually on that note with uh, Roxy Music, I can show you Roxy Music's first album. <laughs> and you can see Phil Manzanera there with his Red Firebird. But if you notice as well, Brian Ferry has got a Hagstrom and I've got a Goya, very similar, but a more rare to find uh, version of the Hagstrom. And there's a Les Paul as well, and uh, I do have a Les Paul, um, a 79. So not quite as bad as an early 70s one. Really nice guitar actually with original Demarzios. And you can see I've started to collect each of the guitars on this album cover. Um, although I haven't identified what this guitar is here. I think it's a K or perhaps some uh, Tesco or, or other Japanese um, brand. And I'm not sure about collecting a, uh, a lap steel guitar. Um, but uh, yeah, great album. And in fact, one thing I'd finally, finally say is what I love about it is the drumming. You know, for an art school album, the, the drumming is really muscular. So Paul Thompson, the drummer, is, you know, to me, an essential part of Roxy Music, as well as the, the mad stylings and uh, Eno's warblings. So, thank you. I um, hope, hope you did stick with me this long to talk about why I picked up a guitar. Um, I've got some more guitars to uh, review soon. I just need to take the time to actually film them and make some more videos. So, thank you.